A little bit late, but I will do my best to stick to the schedule. I hope uh, there's some question time for questions at the end. And uh, today I'm going to talk about a new web browser uh, that we are, well, launching in the context of a project today here with all of you. So I do have a quick question. Um, and you can ask yourself this question too. Is it me? Uh, what, what I mean by this is, for those of you in the room, okay, we've identified that one person in the audience does actually know me. So here physically, we could agree that there is some evidence that I am myself. For those of you on stream or watching a recording of this, how are you gonna know? Olga found out the hard way. Uh, this is an article from yesterday's BBC where it turns out that a Ukrainian woman, her likeness was cloned, deep faked, and then used in China to sell Russian products. And it seems to her that that's not really great. <laughs> and the, the notion of the deep fake and of the human identity is a key part of what we're going to be talking about today. Back about 15 years ago, a Swiss philosopher named Regula Stempfli, she said a very, very brief phrase, in media ergo sum, I know myself through the media that I take. I have the right to take a selfie in front of the Mona Lisa. I have the right to experience my life as a mediated being. Unfortunately, this was a decade before deepfakes even were a thing. And now, if we go back to Olga for a second, her actual memory of herself has now been corrupted, right? She sees her face and suddenly she's speaking Chinese. And that does not match up with her lived experience. So what I want to talk a lot about today is what actually browsing is, how we've become browsers in the context of aimlessly searching for something without a shopping list, but with a lot of cash, right? If, if you think about the, the way that a, a human being who is browsing in a shop is aimlessly wandering and is confronted with the things that they find interesting and maybe they buy them. If, if we go back 30 years to the beginning of this conference, um, the, the notion of what we all can do on the web, how we can experience the world, capture knowledge, reflect on experience, seems a little idealistic. And, you know, at the, at the previous session, just a little while ago here in this room, we were talking about the semantic web, right? And if, if we start to really semantically analyze this whole notion of browsing, it would suggest that we've been painted into a corner, right? We've been painted into a spot where we don't exactly know what we're doing. We're, we're being given tools to do things. It's like being given a constructed language, like Kiswahili, that was designed for trading not for expressing feelings of the heart, right? Our tools that we use define us. But they also kind of imprison us. And I guess the, the point of the modern internet, the modern web, is we are in a sense being held hostage by a notion of identity that we did not construct. We were given this identity by the people who make the tools that let us interact with the universe that we experience. 
Uh, that's actually a Unix epoch from four minutes ago. Um, and the, the thing that this does to us as people is it disenfranchises us. We would like to argue that there is a notion of human agency in digital worlds. I'm not talking so much about second life. I'm talking about our right to exist, to make decisions and have these digital versions of ourselves be empowered. I don't know, I'm sure all of you remember COVID 2020 and what happened to a lot of my friends was suddenly they were FaceTiming with their families and friends before they would never FaceTime. When they were no longer able to meet the people that they cared about in the real world, they accepted the virtual world as a reflection of the person that they were talking to. I mean, drinks over Zoom, a lot of us did that. Sorry, Thomas, I have to bring the slide because, uh, you know, talking about our agency as people with digital elements suggests that we are empowered to do what we want. And yet, the major browsers, uh, or major browser, depending on how many fingers you want to use to count, are instrumenting a larger ecosystem such that we are still just consumers. We are the ones walking down aimless aisles, picking up stuff that's shiny. Search is a huge moneymaker. I mean, it, it, the, the, the logic here is, is almost absurd. Google pays Safari Mozilla to be the search. And the product is actually the human in the loop. They're paying for that product. They're paying for those eyes, for those search results. And I, it's not my place to judge policy or to judge business interests. I think that, you know, we, we live in a world that has evolved and will continue to evolve. And yet, when foundations are forced to let people go because of potentially poor internal fiscal policy, and it changes the nature of open source, that's where I started to get concerned, right? But it just doesn't end. Uh, this is a, a quote that's been translated from Faith's blog, where now Mozilla is going to start anonymizing search data and using it for interesting reasons. It, it feels a lot like Mozilla started from the right place as a counterpoint to big tech, you know, open source, foundation led. And they're flipped to trying to monetize suddenly. They have to be fiscally and fiduciarily responsible. It means you make some weird decisions sometimes. Like not doing your due diligence on someone whose service you integrate in the browser. It just it's it's it would be mind-boggling if this wasn't something that had been repeating over and over and over. Again. This is the first time that I'm going to say AI in this talk, but yes, we do have to train. And yet the notion of what I communicated with my friends on Reddit now being used and monetized in order to train next generation LLMs, maybe rags, it, it feels icky. I don't know, maybe there's a better word for it. Okay, all right. 
I mean, that's just a, a very brief snapshot of a half dozen things that have shaped the internet the way that everybody is using it for the past decade. It, it still feels like, however, there is something we can do. Like, the ecosystem is like a snake eating itself. It's like piranhas chomping down on each other. And I don't know. Like, I, I look at my daughter, who is now 21, and I see the world that my generation is handing over to them. And I feel kind of disgusted with the, the floods and the, the terrible weather, the wars. It, it feels like we're not paying attention to the world we're living in. I'm not going to say it's because we're so disenfranchised. I'm not that kind of idealistic idiot. I think that it's a very complex power structure. And the first way to, to address this is through a project that we started five years ago, which was uh, and is an experiment in reducing the technological load for people building applications and shipping applications. We were focused on security and making very small apps and making them high performance, you know, with rust on the, the back end. And five years later, we're about to release the, the 2.0 that's even faster and more secure and, and even smaller. And, and that's all fine and good because at the time um, where we released Tauri 1.0, Explorer was uh, going to be deprecated. Same thing with Adam Shell. The week we, were, we announced the 1.0, and they're not, they're not correlating there. But it's interesting to see how technology gets thrown by the wayside, and we still felt like there was something to do. Towery uses the WebView 2 today from uh, Windows, WK WebView on Mac OS, and WebKit GTK on Linux. And I have to tell you, none of them are great. The, the approach that we take to using and leveraging the system WebView means the application that you build using web technologies is maybe only three, four megabytes in size. That's great. However, WebView 2 is Chromium based. Uh, for good or bad, uh, it is um, probably one of the three with the best updating system. I think they spent a lot of time figuring that out. WK WebView on Mac OS is a catastrophe. You can only update it if you update Safari, and certain people can't update Safari because they can't update their OS anymore because they don't have the hardware for it, which means that some people are stuck with ECMAScript 2018. Or 19. And WebKit GTK is a, well, it's the best we can do on Linux today. Um, I, I think that, that Linux has its own fragmentation issues, but there's never been a concerted effort put into unifying the way that web views really work. There's, there's a kind of semi new standards uh, W3C committee. Um, but it's very slow going and it's not going to change. I mean, Apple has a vested interest in making sure you update your hardware. Um, Windows is going to stick with Chromium because that's what Edge is based on, right? Okay. I've been kind of complaining the whole time. When we started working on Towery, we actually thought in 2020, before Servo got axed, we thought maybe we could use uh, Servo as a web view provider, the Servo engine, because Servo is not a browser. Didn't work. We had to wait. And then we collaborated with some fine people from Agalia and from NLNet and worked on 
proving the concept that it is possible to use the servo engine to manifest a web view that can be used by Tauri on all three platforms, which was, in a sense, a breath of fresh air. Anyone who has built a browser will tell you <laughs> that's a spring chicken. You need half a decade and hundreds of millions of uh, dollars and insanely talented engineers who are not afraid to dig deep. But it was a start. Uh, like I said before, the servo engine was a project from Mozilla that is now hosted by the Linux Foundation. It's a web engine. Again, it's not a browser. It's been used in, um, for example, Open Harmony uh, from Huawei. Uh, it's It suffered because the way it was intended was as a, a, a big experiment, the servo engine. And then losing all of the engineers and the focus and the time for three or four years put it in a bad spot. However, uh, at Towery, we've been supporting some of the libraries from the, the servo engine, like HTML5 Fever, the CSS parser, um, because they're still useful. And, and I'm going to come back to this uh, in a minute about how modularity and excellent library design is something that can stand the test of time. It can stand the changes of Mozilla laying off the entire team. It can withstand the, the test of uh, new ideas coming in. And in this process of verifying that we could do it, we discussed a number of ways of how to get the web view out there. How do we distribute a web view to everyone who wants to use it? How do we solve the, the hard problems of what a browser needs to be? Because today's browser, like if we were starting all over, if the first browser that we were ever going to make was designed in 2024, it would be different than the stuff that we have today. Absolutely. I'll talk about how in a second. We put together a bit of a roadmap about all of the different pieces that we just want to put together in order to get to a kind of stable MVP. There's the web view side where we want to have multiple web views maybe stacked on top of each other inside of the same window context. We want to be able to render off screen. We want to improve Servo's developer experience. The Servo engine, like I said, was designed and built 10 years ago. So there's a lot of rough edges of things that can and should be improved, and we're already contributing to make that happen. And then we're going to get into profiles, security, interfaces, a, UI, a EU identity wallet, web machine learning standards, passwordless. There's like, once you start thinking about all of the things that you want to put into a browser on top of having CSS3 and uh, the, all the niceties of the latest ECMAScript and local storage and IndexedDB and and, and you, you take a step back, and if you, if you remember the slides that I was starting this, this conversation with, or monologue, <laughs> the idea of the individual as being empowered in the digital realm is something that we have entrusted the state and the, the, the corporate uh, entities to. Um, I think that they've both done the best they could But we, we think we can do better. And there's some principles that I'll talk about in a minute. But the, the main components I'll go into in depth. First and foremost, 
A servo engine at the base, because it's modular, means things that don't work for the Verso team can be removed. If we decide we want a new WASM-based JavaScript engine, we can, we can do that. We can also contribute it back to the servo engine upstream so people have more options. We're taking this step by step, right? Once you have an engine that does what it should, being able to use it as a CLI tool for headless purposes is really quite elegant. I mean, you can use the actual browser itself to do things like curl and wget and uh, maybe even SSH. You know, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of ways to think about how you are securing and negotiating remote connections with the interface that your users are using. It sounds trivial, but having multiple window contexts is important for a lot of reasons. I mean, I, I know personally, I am on three devices in a normal day, and being able to associate that content across device and even on the same device is relevant for a reason I'll talk about in a second. I already mentioned about having a, a web view. This is critical for a lot of a lot of products that want to focus on very secure baselines. They want to use local first methodologies. And it comes back to why we got involved in this in the first place. Right? When I'm using the internet, which me? Like, is it me? Um, Google, Firefox, they let you have slightly different profiles. Where are all the passwords stored? Once we start integrating LLMs, local LLMs, remote LLMs, RAG, uh, inference, should every shard of my identity know everything about every other shard of my identity? I don't think so. And we, we also agree that we want to default to incognito, to pure anonymous, to never accepting cookies, and allow the user to generate and grow individual usage profiles that have discrete identities, that have discrete secure storage, and discrete LLM interfaces. And that's because all of these three things are now starting to play, uh, play together, where the identity that I have as the set of all sets, the set of all Daniels, as it were, is probably more than I need if I'm reading the news in the morning. If I am shopping on my phone for flights to Singapore. It doesn't need to know about where my daughter lives. And so by, by sharding these types of activities and encapsulating the knowledge that is needed in order to participate in this internet um, through the profile management identity engine, and the storage and signing activities, we start to see more opportunities in the not so distant future, right? Where if I'm using this browser or, or because it's composable, I'm building a tool that leverages this system that is on the user's device, I can actually guarantee that the video content being captured on this device is representative of me. I have my signing keys. I signed the stream, you know. There's, there's, there's really important paradigm shifts here once we start 
thinking about the modularity of the systems we can build. And, and, and you might notice we call it an identity engine, and that's because having a source of truth is important when you are negotiating you know, your beingness with the person who's consuming you. I, maybe we need a whole new uh, etymology, a whole new vocabulary, a new way to think about what we are doing with the internet today. And um, we've already started. So we applied for some grants back in February and then another round of grants in April, and we are finishing off those uh, pieces of paperwork. Um, we've put together a couple dozen excited, motivated, and uh, deeply talented engineers. And we expect sometime end of this year, beginning of next year, to have something approaching an MVP. Now, like I said, we want to close the grant funding in the next month or so, so that we have enough financial means to support the engineers who are working on this project. We're going to be setting up a nonprofit organization at the Commons Conservancy. If you don't know the Commons Conservancy, it's a Dutch foundation that acts as a, a legal body for, um, for open source projects. Towery itself is also in the Commons Conservancy. We're going to start reaching out to places and people uh, like uh, you here in this room, you here on stream, we're not going to sell search. I, I think that that's just a, a, a demeaning situation for us, um, and that's because we don't want to. We don't want to sell out. Um, we're interested in convincing next generation internet to accept Verso as a pilot project in order to bring the European funding schemes uh, at commission level to come to the understanding that it is possible to make something that is utilitarian and safe and good, but you can't just do it once. You have to get into this and then kind of play that, that infinite game. So Verso is a common good. We believe that the only way to make software is in the community as open source and Keep it that way forever. That's why we're joining the foundation. Verso is composable and reusable. And this is that notion of dual purpose. Maybe Verso doesn't work. Weirder things have happened. But we will be making components that, like the servo engines components from 10 years ago, can be maintained and, as long as they're useful, Develop further. This will not be run by or for a foundation, uh, for a corporation. Um, this is, is something that has to be owned, as it were, by the people and funded only from grants, donations, and volunteership. So, thank you. I have two QR codes here if you're interested. Uh, the left hand side, you'll see the QR code to the nightly release. Uh, and on the right-hand side, the GitHub repo. Now, a word of caution, the nightly release is a verification that our CI CD works, and uh, I don't expect much from it right now, uh, but, you know, baby steps. And please uh, feel free to visit the GitHub repo, um, star it if you like, file an issue, file a complaint, and um, yeah. That's my, my talk about Verso. Thanks, everybody.